Hi, I'm Stephanie and this is my home, the 16th century Chateau de Lalande. Lalande was owned for hundreds of years by a family of marquises who were at the heart of French royal life. One of them even had the honour of being sent by King Louis XV to greet Marie Antoinette on her arrival in France. But, far from being a stuffy museum, this chateau is a living home. I live here all the time and I'm regularly joined by my mother, my family, my friends and wonderful volunteers from all over the world who help me to lovingly restore this historic home. Welcome to La Lande, a chateau filled with life, love and laughter. Welcome to our Chapel of St. Joseph. I'm greeting you here today instead of at the Chateau door because I really want to show you this gem of a chapel dating from 1866. Come in. I'm so happy to finally be doing a tour of this chapel. I think that although it's one of the more modern parts of the Chateau, it's one of the most precious. There is no other part of the Chateau de Lalande which is so covered in architectural detailing and decoration which shows just how loved this chapel was. The family that we bought the chapel from were the Marquis of Nadayac, a very ancient French noble family. They were the ones who had the chapel built back in the 19th century and you can still see their coat of arms just above the door as you come in. Above that is the statue of St. Joseph holding Jesus, flanked on either side by angels. The doors that you came through are also highly ornamented. These beautiful brackets actually have grapes on them and leaves. And we're very confused by the door handle and maybe one of you will be able to tell us why it is that it may be in the shape of a frog. We don't understand what the significance would be for a chapel. My mother wonders if, although it looks exactly like a frog, it's maybe a lamb and it could be the lamb of God. So the jury is out. The interior of the door is even more spectacular. You can see these beautiful decorations and this lattice work and a spectacular lock again with the frog lamb. We couldn't actually open these doors, but Percy restored them last year. So finally, they open fully and are looking much, much better. The entire interior of the chapel is decorated. There is not one square inch of chapel that isn't heavily worked on. All of the walls have spectacular murals in the neo-Gothic style. The neo-Gothic style was made very famous by architects such as Viollet le Duc, and they were inspired by the medieval Gothic periods, especially buildings like La Sainte Chapelle in Paris. That's what these smaller chapels were emulating, and so magnificently. The walls are a rich purple repeating pattern covered in gold. And in the areas where they haven't been damaged, you can see just how brilliant it must have looked when it was all sparkling by candlelight. And it was very fashionable to have fake folds of fabric painted on to the murals. There's another repeating pattern above the frieze, which is a much lighter lilac, which helps to lighten the space, even though it's so heavily decorated. The pillars are different again, and they alternate around the room. Two of them are this rich blue covered in gold and crosses. And then there are the orange pillars with a spiral of flowers and repeating patterns. At the back, there are navy blue pillars, again with golden crosses. And the last ones nearest to the altar are orange with a diamond pattern filled with crosses and leaves. The ceiling is my favorite thing about the entire chapel. It is a brilliant blue night sky covered with golden stars. I can't imagine how long it must have taken to paint it. And each of the vaults has wonderful decoration running along it down to the top of a Corinthian column, each one a different color and covered again with gold. The floor is made of encaustic tiles with a gorgeous pattern and it has a frieze going all of the way around the room and a slightly different pattern, more ornate as you get towards the altar. And you'll see that here and there, there are vents in the floor 
and I will tell you what they were for at the end of the tour, but it's quite exciting. But there's not just beautiful repeating patterns in the chapel. There is a mural depicting what we think must be the death of St. Joseph. We wondered at first if it was Lazarus, but he doesn't look as though he's about to get out of bed. So we feel that it's probably Jesus at his father's death. Jesus is holding his father's hand and giving him a benediction whilst his mother, the Virgin Mary, prays next to St. Joseph. At his feet are two angels, one whose head is bowed in prayer. Even the detailing of the woodwork on the bed is exquisite, again in the neo-Gothic style. It's a beautiful mural, sadly very damaged over time because there was a lot of water infiltration. In the bottom left-hand corner of that mural, there is a signature, Angulière, 1868. So it was completed after the chapel was consecrated and it deserves to be properly restored. Whoever Angulière was, he made a beautiful piece of art and probably wouldn't want to see it in this state. I always think of the original artists because I know that there is a lot of argument as to how much should we restore buildings from the past and I think that there are excellent arguments on both sides. A lot of people get upset when something is over-restored and looks new again because it loses a lot of the charm and the patina of age. But I try to think of the original artist, especially knowing my father. My father, I know, he passed away in 2005 and he wouldn't want to see his paintings deteriorating. I think that he would want restoration. And certainly, when he was alive, he wanted this chapel to be restored. So I would like it as much as possible to be brought back to the way that it was when it was finished by the amazing artists who worked on it so that people can come in and get that sense of wonder that they would have felt on the first day that they stepped into this chapel. Now I'm standing underneath the missing vault in the chapel and looking up, I can see straight onto the roof. This is a bit that frightens me the most. There's really a lot of work to be done and I probably shouldn't be standing right here. I'll move back. But first I wanted to show you that we have actually fit electricity into the chapel. There was no electricity when we first arrived. And I found these wonderful Fontini switches that look like marble, golden marble. And I think that fits in with the strong decorative sense here. And this is where the holy water would have been kept so that all of the people coming to worship could have come first to make the sign of the cross with holy water before taking their seat in the chapel. As you can see with the parts that I've shown to you, the chapel has been very, very badly damaged. When we arrived, the first work we ever did in the chateau was to re-roof the chapel because the vault had already collapsed, water was coming in everywhere and it was damaging not only the roof, but the exquisite wall decorations and many of the stained glass windows had missing sections. Birds were coming in easily, as you can see from the extraordinary mess on the poor saints. This one has been particularly badly affected. But I don't want to get up there and start cleaning it off with water because I don't know if the paint on the statues is water-based and I don't want to do any damage. So I'm waiting for the chapel restorer to come and tell us what exactly we can and cannot do. Now, the water is not coming into the chapel anymore. There is a new roof, we have replaced the gutters, and all of the windows have been made good so far. As you'll see, one is missing, and the exciting news is that that one, whose entire face had completely gone, has been at the stained glass window restorers for about eight years, but we couldn't afford to do the restoration. But the first target that we reached on my Patreon account was to restore this window and we hit that target just before Easter Sunday. So I was able to phone the restorer and she's just let us know that she will be coming to put the window back in mid-July. And we will have a very big celebration on the day that that happens. And I think, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was Saint Cecilia who went and it would be wonderful to have her back as a patron saint of musicians. All of the windows here were made by an artist called Marc de Toulouse. And unfortunately, he is rather infamous for not having set the faces enough. So in all of the churches he worked on, the faces become very, very faint over time. In the first stained glass windows that we did have restored, because we've been going through restoring them one by one, the faces have had just a few more delicate lines added so that they can be seen again, which is wonderful. If you look at the angel Gabriel, you can see the eyes. 
That's the work that we had done to just slightly bring life back to the windows. Most of the interior fittings in the chapel do come from Toulouse, which seems strange because we're in the middle of France here, rather far from Toulouse. But the Nadayaks had two castles, one here and one in the lot, which is much nearer to Toulouse. And so they knew a lot of artisans there. The windows even had a pulley system to open and close them, which is no longer working. But we're going to keep the fittings for the pulley. And there are still some ropes hanging down from the ceiling because we still have one of the original lights for the ceiling, which would have had to be lowered to light the candles. Imagine this all polished up again. It's going to be absolutely splendid. There are a total of 11 stained glass windows in the chapel. Around the altar of the Holy Family, we have St. Joseph, then the Sacred Heart of Christ, and the Virgin Mary and Child with an angel next to them. They take up four of the stained glass windows. Another one is the rose window over the front door. And then there is a small window of St. John the Baptist in the sacristy. The other five windows are of saints. And there's one in particular that I would like to pick out to show you today, St. Aloysius. He was born during the Italian Renaissance in 1585, and he was sent at the age of only five to military training camp because his father wanted him to be a soldier. At the age of only eight, he was sent to the court of the Grand Duke Francesco I de Medici in Florence, but there he fell very sick with a kidney disease. Whilst he was sick, at that young age, he spent all of his time in prayer and reading about the lives of the saints. And apparently at the age of nine, he took a private vow of chastity. Nothing could be done to dissuade him from following his religious path. So he moved to Rome and became a Jesuit. Whilst he was there, plague broke out in the city and the Jesuits opened a hospital for those stricken with the illness. He insisted on working there even though he hated every moment of it, but he would personally feed the sick, wash their wounds, even carry the dying from the streets to the hospital. Just days before his 23rd birthday, Aloysius caught the plague. He became very sick and was bedridden for several weeks, but it looked as though he was pulling through. But no, he told everybody around him, he knew that he was going to die. He'd seen it in a vision. He was going to die on the octave of the feast of Corpus Christi, the 21st of June, 1591. On the morning of that day, he seemed to have made a recovery and everybody told him he was being silly, he was getting better. But he said, no, no, I do insist, I will die today. In the evening, he took a turn for the worse and died just before midnight, holding his crucifix. The attributes of a saint are the symbols that they're often shown with in statues or paintings of them, so worshippers knew who was who. And Aloysius of Gonzaga is almost always shown as a young man wearing a cassock and a surplice, as he is here. He's also usually shown with a skull, signifying his early death, and a lily, signifying his innocence. But I notice that they've added another element here, which I find very interesting. If you look to the bottom left, there is a crown, and that was the symbol of a marquis in France. So I think it was very important to this family to show that piety could be found in the highest echelons of aristocracy. They were marquis, and so was he. And in fact, the Nadayaks were very, very religious. And of the 11 children that we bought the chateau from, two were priests. And if you have time, I'm going to put to a link to one of my vlogs here, which is really worth watching if you're interested in the chapel, because one of those priests came back to visit Lalande. He was in his late 80s, and he actually celebrated mass for us here in the chapel. I myself am not very religious, but I have a great respect for people who are, and for buildings like this that show what people can achieve when they believe in something together and they want to create good and beauty in the world. And to see him celebrating mass in the chapel of the chateau that had belonged to his ancestors for hundreds of years was incredibly moving and I had tears in my eyes. The altar itself is a work of art and it was made for this chapel. Everything here was made for the chapel and I think that makes it an extraordinarily important architectural monument. It's extraordinarily ornate and sumptuous and like the rest of the chapel, 
highly decorated. There are golden leaves. Here we have green leaves and red berries. And in the center is what looks like Jesus holding the Ten Commandments. You can just see there's faint numbers, one, two, three, four, five on one side. And in the background, crosses in a beautiful diamond pattern and Corinthian columns. I love this. It's just exquisite, the detailing. My grandmother was extremely religious and she used to teach catechism in the south of France and she collected altar cloths long before we had a chapel in the family. So now, wonderfully, my grandmother's altar cloths are in the chapel. Many of the candlesticks here are original to the chapel. We've put in a lot more as well, but these are original. Isn't that glorious? All of the statues are original to the chapel and represent different saints. The saints would all have been chosen by the family and they would have had special meaning to them. This saint has a crown of roses, a golden plate, a palm leaf and a book. And with that, we should be able to find out who she is. The detailing of the statues is extraordinary. Just look at the lace on this chasuble. Even the altar rails are original. No expense was spared for any of the details in this chapel. The metalwork is exquisite, even more so on the door to the sacristy. Here we have another frog or lamb. We still don't know which. And look at these doors. Have you ever seen anything so gorgeous? More of these berries or grapes. I don't know what they're supposed to be. A lot of the sacristy still has that original lilac decoration. The maker's mark is still on the the maker's mark is still on the lovely the maker's mark is still on the wonderful metal doors. Everyard, Paris. Tree foils, fleur de lys. Oh, the doors are wonderful. I could just stare at the doors for hours. This is the original piece of furniture that was made for the sacristy. The doors have linen fold panelling. And when you open these two huge doors, you see many rows of tiny shallow drawers. And that's because this is where the priest would store his vestments. And that way they would be kept nice and flat and unfolded. There are cupboards on either side. Everything needed for the mass would be kept in here. And the statue of the Virgin means a lot to me because she is the only statue that we brought ourselves. She belonged to my great grandmother. So it's as though she is with us here. And just in here, I have holy water from Lourdes that belonged to my grandmother. So it truly is a family chapel again. We found this inside the chapel. I don't know which part of the chapel it would have been in originally, but it's a plaster support for a statue. And our statue is just a little bit too big to be put in here. But when the chapel is restored, I would like this to go out again and I will find a statue to fit it. And just above the statue of the Virgin is St. John the Baptist. Very excitingly, I have the letter from the man who made this piece of furniture telling the Marquis that it was ready and that it would be sent just as soon as the railway line was properly up and running again. And I will show you that letter now. I feel so lucky that we have this. The plans for the Chapel of Lalande, 1866 to 67. Now the very first thing in here is extremely damaged, but this is the state that we received it in. And a friend of mine tried to get it restored, but the restorer said they couldn't tackle this. So I need to find somebody one day who is able to tackle something this bad. But this is the certificate saying that the chapel was consecrated in 1866. We can just still see the date. And at the beginning of the plans, we have this letter 
At first I thought that it must be a condolence letter because of the black band, but in fact, no. Don't seem to be any condolences. It's the most gorgeous and tiny handwriting. Monsieur le Marquis, I've just finished the piece of furniture to hold the vestments in the sacristy. And it ends by saying, please give my homage to Madame la Marquise and assure her that the project will be sent to her within the next three or four days. And I think that if she adopts this little piece of furniture, she will find that it does not detract from the beauty of her sacristy or her chapel. Well, it certainly doesn't. 150 years later, it is still not detracting from the beauty of her chapel. And look at this, the original drawing for that piece of furniture with the painted decoration that's in the sacristy and the stained glass window of John the Baptist, all planned in advance. Made in Toulouse, the 4th of October, 1867, for the Chapelle du Château de la Lande. In front of the altar, there is some lily of the valley, which we've put here in honor of the 1st of May, because in France, it's tradition to give lily of the valley as a gift for good luck on the 1st of May. And that tradition dates back to the Renaissance. Catherine de' Medici was traveling with her son, King Charles IX, to a town called Saint Paul Trois Châteaux, or Saint Paul Three Châteaux. And they were given by their host a gift of Lily of the Valley on the 1st of May, 1560. King Charles was so entranced by that idea that the following year, he gifted Lily of the Valley to every one of the ladies of the court, telling everybody to do so on the 1st of May every year from then on. The tradition had all but died out at the turn of the 19th century, when it was strangely brought back to life by the couturiers of Paris, who used to give Lily of the Valley on the 1st of May to their clients. Christian Dior in the 50s revived the tradition again and took Lily of the Valley as his own symbol. And his famous perfume, Diorissime, in 1956 is based on the scent of Lily of the Valley. It also has a strong Catholic tradition because it's said that the tears of the Virgin at the foot of the cross turned into Lily of the Valley but it dates far beyond that. In Greek legend, it was created by Apollo to carpet Mount Parnassus so that the nine muses wouldn't hurt their feet. And now, just before you leave, I want to show you the secret of the chapel that we knew nothing about when we first bought and discovered completely by accident. But for that, you need to follow me outside. Now I'll show you a real secret of the chapel that we only discovered a year or so after we arrived here. And it lurks beneath these planks. We were having the guttering repaired. There's a stone along the very top and part of it was broken. So a stonemason came to replace it and he had a cherry picker here. And unbeknownst to him and to us, it must have broken a piece of stone here underneath the grass, you just, it just looked like a lawn. And later, as he was walking along, he disappeared into the ground here. And that is when we found that, in fact, there is a surprise exactly at this point, which Selma hasn't seen yet, so this is the first time. And something to do with water. You don't know it. We haven't opened this in a very long time, so I wonder if you can even get to it, yes? So goodness knows what state it's in there because I don't think we've looked in there for about seven years. Thank goodness the stonemason was fine and quite excited by his discovery afterwards. What other surprises lurk in the chateau? It's the underfloor heating system for the chapel dating from 1866. How extraordinary is that? 1866 underfloor heating. Pretty modern chapel we had. And somebody would go down there, light a fire, and then through a system of vents, the hot air would come up into the chapel. There's even the remains of what seems to be part of the chimney system for it. It's too exciting not to go in. I can't waste this opportunity. I have no idea how to do this. You sound worried, Antoine. You think I can't do it. We cannot stop Here we are underground in the chapel heating system. 
And this is the oven that we can't open because it's rusted shut. There's a lot to discover here. And just at my feet, you can see the broken stone that was originally under the turf and that was broken by the cherry picker, thereby nearly causing the demise of our stonemason. Right, I'm coming back out. I think that getting out might be slightly harder than getting in. Right. I feel like this is a step in the right direction. Which way am I going here? Uh, did it! See if we can get it working again and put a lovely glass dome on top. And before you leave the chapel at the end of your visit, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you because you have made my dream come true. Finally, this chapel will be restored to its former glory. Because of my patrons and because of all of you who watch the adverts on these vlogs, the chapel will be restored as soon as lockdown is over and the final stained glass window will also be returned. Thank you for joining me for this tour of the Chapel of St. Joseph and I'll see you next week to show you more of the secrets of the Chateau de Lalande. Until then, bye from Lalande. A huge thank you to all of our patrons at Lalande who are making this vlog possible, especially our Marquis and Marquises of Lalande. Dan Banda, Daniela, Danielle Bernakovic, Veronica Castillo, Laura Damari, Caroline Furster, Brenda Gibbons, Lorca Hutikova, JC Ward, Maureen Palmer, Colleen Troyer, Brian Woodward and David Young. And thank you to all of you. Mm -hmm.